Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Having some technical difficulties with my notes. That's okay. We're good. Um, welcome to Calvary Chapel. If it's uh, your first time, it's so good to have you guys here uh, this morning. If you were able to make our breakfast, I hope you were. It was a really, really good time. Remember, uh, we are going to do breakfast once a month. We'll serve it here for you. It's going to be a really, really good thing. It's going to be uh, it's, it's a great time to fellowship, meet with one another before the service. Uh, yeah, just a t- an opportunity for you guys to fellowship with one another. So it was a great time this morning. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our study of God's Word. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, we thank you uh, that you are a God of the new. You are a God of new creation, of new beginnings, or you are a God of restoration, you are a God of healing. You are a God of trajectory, Lord. We thank you that you are using this church, God, for your glory. Lord, we thank you that we don't exist to simply uh, glorify ourselves. We don't exist to please ourselves. God, we exist to bring you glory. That is our whole purpose, Lord. And so I ask that this morning in the preaching of your word, Lord, that you would speak to your church. For those who know you, I ask that your word would penetrate hearts really, really deeply, that you would encourage, that you would exhort, that you would reprove, that you would uplift, and you would even bring down, Lord. You, God, would be speaking to your church this morning. Lord, for those who don't know you, for those who are not Christians here this morning, I pray, Lord, that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you who are the Savior of all men, especially those who believe, Lord Jesus, you would be very real to them this morning. God, I pray that your gospel would penetrate hearts. Lord, that repentance, Lord, would even happen this morning in this church. God, would you move by your Holy Spirit today? In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're in the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to continue our study. Uh, We're almost done with chapter 4, and then we'll march in, obviously, to chapter 5. That's obviously what we do at Calvary Chapel, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And this morning we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. We're going to get to about 10. We're going to try to get to 10, but that's, that's the goal. Um, last week, if you were with us, I had to stop. Unfortunately, I had to come to an abrupt halt. My time went out, and I just needed to pause. And so we're going to pick up where we should have ended last week, and then we'll just keep moving forward into the rest of chapter 4. So last week we ended in verse 4 and verse 5. And I just want to touch on something really quickly, and then we'll get, we'll get moving. Paul says in verse 4, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy, verse 5, by the word of God in prayer. Remember at this time, and in this section um, of the church's life, there, there was some apostasy happening in Ephesus. People were spurring false doctrine and and, and things that were taking people away from the true gospel. A gospel where there is much liberty. A gospel where there is no legalism. A gospel where there is no no law. There's a gospel that actually says you need to be holy as God is holy. There's a gospel that says you can be transformed into the likeness of God himself. But in Ephesus, there were some really wonky things going on with teaching. Um, People were saying... Ridiculous things like you can't eat certain things and actually you can't even marry. Uh, marriage is bad and food is bad. These things are not good. These, this was a Gnostic heresy. What's so interesting about this passage is that it comes in direct contradiction to what God had established in Genesis chapter 1. Especially pertaining to food in marriage. Remember in verse 24 of chapter 1 in Genesis, God is literally saying good, 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 good. Food is good. My creation is good. Animals are good. Vegetables are good. Water is good. Air is good. I'm creating all of these things to be good. And then all of a sudden he creates man and woman. And he changes something from good to something that's very good. All of this, everything that I'm creating is so good. But man and woman, that's very good. And their union is very good. Their companionship is very good. It's interesting that what the Gnostics were saying in Ephesus was in direct contradiction what God had established way back in the garden. Isn't that so in keeping with how the enemy operates? God has said something. This is what is. In fact, this is what is good. But actually, because I'm so deceptive, because my language is a bunch of lies, 
I'm going to take what God has said and try to completely dilute it. In fact, he did that. Remember to Eve. Has God really said? Has God really said? And so here in Ephesus, the enemy is seeking its way into the church. Remember, Paul feared in Acts chapter 20 that wolves would come in. The wolves officially have come into Ephesus. Heresy is being taught. Apostasy is happening. People are falling away from the faith. All because people are completely mishandling truth. The word of God. But then God, through the Apostle Paul, said, says that actually everything, everything that has been created should be received with thanksgiving. Can I just say that the gospel, the Christian life, is full of liberty. There are so many rich and bountiful things that we can enjoy because we're Christians. We can freely receive things. We can freely participate in things because we have the word of God that's a lamp to our feet because we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit who will give us understanding to all of this stuff. And so the Christian life isn't a life full of rules and regulations. It's actually a life full of freedom and liberty. In fact, Paul would say where the spirit of the Lord is to the, to the Corinthian church, there is liberty. And then there's this interesting phrase in verse 5, for everything is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Simply put, everything that is, is made holy because God has said it is to be holy. Food is holy. F food is a good thing. Food is a consecrated thing because God said in the garden it was good. Marriage is a good thing. One man, one woman joined in that beautiful binary gender is a good thing. Because God has said it's a very, very good thing. And so we shouldn't despise those things. We should receive those things with a lot, a lot, a lot of thanksgiving. And we're able to do that. We're able to eat food. We're able to be married. Because God has said it is so good. And in those things, there is so much freedom and so much liberty. Can I say something real quick? It's interesting to me that there, and I was, and sometimes still struggle this way. Somehow we compartmentalize the gospel to a certain time in our life. Sometimes we, we say, oh, I remember the gospel. The gospel was when I went down in that Billy Graham crusade and I kneeled at that altar and I said that prayer and that was my experience for the gospel. That's it. And everything now that I'm doing in my life has nothing to do really with the gospel. It has everything to do with just kind of religious exercise. But the gospel, you see, is something we need every single day. By the way, the gospel isn't just that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's certainly the gospel. But the gospel is, as Paul says to the Galatian church, are literally promises upon promises through Abraham's seed, which now are ours because of what Jesus did for us. What does that mean for you? That means that the gospel of Jesus Christ for your life this morning, for your life this life, isn't just, man, Jesus Christ saved me because of, I mean, I don't have to go to hell now. My sins are forgiven. The gospel is yes, and you have so much promise in God because of the gospel. That means you absolutely have a freedom to live under the gospel and in the gospel and in this Christian life in so many rich and bountiful ways. It's interesting how religion chokes the freedom of the gospel. It's interesting how religious exercise can choke the freedom of the gospel. It's interesting how ridiculous heresies can absolutely strain the gospel and replace it with a false gospel. If you have been saved, know this Christian, you are not just saved you are being saved every single day as God is transforming you into who Jesus Christ is until you go to glory. So you need the gospel every single day. You need that cleansing flood in your life every single day. You need the promises of Abraham that God has given us through Abraham by the gospel every single day. It's the gospel that is so incredible. And it's interesting to know that in every single, most, excuse me, most every single of Paul's epistles was always because the gospel was under attack. Paul is always going to war with those who would literally try to, to make a blunder of the pure gospel according to grace. According to grace. 
And now Paul's going to turn the turret onto his own protege, Timothy. From verses 6 to verses 10, Paul's really going to give Timothy char- a charge on how to be a good minister. Let me just say something before we get into this, though. I certainly hope that if you're a believer here this morning, and you're thinking, great, more exhortation about a minister. I am not one. <laughs> so why does this matter for me? I'm not called to the ministry. I'm not going into the pulpit. I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to really even serve a whole lot. I'm just a Christian. Well, if that's what your understanding is of what a minister is, I have to tell you, if you are a Christian, you are a minister. Every single Christian has been given by Jesus Christ himself, Matthew chapter 28, a marching order, a commission, which is to what? Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things that I have told you. So if you are a Christian, here's here's the cool thing. You're a minister. If you're a Christian, you have an opportunity to minister the gospel in any single sphere you live in. So as we get into this section of Scripture, and Paul is exhorting Timothy and giving him encouragement, you need to place your name exactly where Timothy is. Furthermore, I want, to ask, I want to ask you a question to ask yourself. How are you being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ today? What is your sphere of influence? Where are you working? How are you living? Who is your family? Who are people that you could call? How are you literally saying, I have been saved. Now what, I, what can I do with it for Jesus' glory? This section of scripture is going to help us figure that one out. Verse 6, Paul says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Timothy, remember, was just given all of this instruction. He was given all of these things, what to correct. Remember, he was correcting behavior. He was correcting false doctrine and false teaching. He's setting into order this church in Ephesus because God is about to do something pretty incredible through the church in Ephesus. And so God is sending this forerunner, if you will, this forerunning pastor to really set things into order. And now Timothy is being encouraged to bring these things up, to put these things in order, to put these things into place because why? Because in doing that, he's going to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. He's going to be able to take what was given to him. He's going to be able to show it to the elders, show it to the brothers, show it to the sisters, show it to the church and say, look, this is how we need to be as church. Paul says in doing that, he was, to, he was being a good servant of Jesus Christ. The question that I have for you, minister, Christian, in this room this morning, is what has God given you? What has God shown you? What has God passed on to your very life? If anything but the gospel itself, what has God given you that you're to bring? That you're to present? That you're to show? That you're to see, look what I have been given. If anything, look at the gospel. Look how I've been saved. Look what Jesus did with my life. Let me show you. Let me tell you. Let me give you like the name of him who saved my very soul and made me a new creation. All of us, I've been commissioned by God to present that beautiful gift, the gospel, to others. And whereby doing, we certainly are being a good servant of Christ Jesus, as Timothy would be, as he brings these doctrinal fixing things to this church in Ephesus. And then he's to be trained, or he was trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Paul, all through his letters, was giving doctrine. That's what he did. He would continually give doctrine to the churches. Romans 16, 17, 1 Timothy 1, 3, 1 Timothy 6, 3. Paul is literally spreading out doctrine so that the church would know how to act and how to be and how to believe. You remember Peter actually recorded something about Paul in his own letter. Peter says of Paul that his letters were actually circulating, although they're hard to understand. What Peter wrote about. What what instruction he gave at times would be kind of like, whoa, what are you talking about, Romans chapter 1? What are you talking about? Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. What does that mean? How is that supposed to translate into who we are as a church? So Paul was always giving out that doctrine. And by the way, the Greek word for doctrine is just simply teaching. Teaching. 
He's imparting teaching to the churches. He's imparted teaching to Timothy. Timothy's being trained in that teaching, and he's moving forward in the mission that God has given him. By the way, this is for all of us. This is for every single Christian here this morning. How are you yourself as a believer being trained in the teaching that has been passed to you? Really, what does your quiet time look like? How are you meeting and communing with Jesus every single day, every single week, every single year, and every single month? Let me just say something, though. Some of us literally replace our quiet time with a genuine experience with Jesus. What do I mean by that? Some of us are so much in a discipline rotation of waking up at 6 a.m., opening up our Bibles, having our cup of coffee, we check the block, we close our Bibles, we hit the kids and changing their diapers, and we hit the road to get into the whatever we're going to, and that's our meeting with Jesus. That's what we would consider receiving the good teaching in our own life. But that is a very, very unfortunate progress for you, Christian, if that is the extent of how you are consuming good doctrine. If that's it, that's all you got, that's all you're doing, let me just encourage you in two other ways that you can really grow in the teaching and the doctrine that has been given to you in our Christian faith. Absolutely reading the Word of God, 150%. Reading the Word of God, and by the way, it's all about the Word of God. It's all about the Scripture. It's all about the Bible that we say is the Word of God. So reading the Word of God. Next, I would say being under the Word of God. How are you being under the Word of God? Are you going to church on Sunday? Are you joining a Bible study? Do you have a favorite pastor or maybe a few favorite pastors or teachers that you can plug into your ears and you can just literally soak under the Word of God? I'll just say this. There are some times in my mornings and my days that I get into such a rhythm that I actually don't have time necessarily to open my Bible and have my coffee, although I want to. When that happens, I'm able to go into my, some of my apps, throw on a good, solid Bible teaching, and I'm just sitting under the Word of God as God is speaking to my heart through the preaching of the Word. And then lastly, I would say reading about the Word of God. Reading the Word of God for yourself, sitting under the Word of God, and reading about the Word of God. What do I mean by that? If I were to ask you, how do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? I mean, it really gets stupid. I hate to say that. If I'm up here banging the drum of, hey, read your Bible. Hey, have your quiet time. Hey, get under the Word of God. Sit under some solid Bible teaching, gospel preaching. Do that if we really don't understand how we even got the Bible. How do you know that this book, this 66-chaptered and chronicled book, is the living Word of God, the Bible? So many people are asking that today. Okay, you're saying that the Bible is the Word of God, but how do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? So it's good to know about the Word of God, to be under the Word of God, and to be reading the Word of God ourselves. But let me just reiterate this point. If you become so much involved in the motions of doing this, be careful that it doesn't become your own religious exercise. Guard yourself and make sure that when you are getting into the word, you are genuinely meeting and experiencing Jesus. That he's speaking to you through his word. That it's growing you and changing you and conforming you into who he is. Not in somebody who can say, look how many Bible verses I've memorized. That's not the point. The point is to grow up in our most holy faith. And then Paul says to Timothy, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Remember, there is rampant heresy going on in, in, in Ephesus. People were really freaking out and saying really, really weird things. In fact, your translation may say old woman's fables, literally myths. Timothy was sent there to correct those things, to put those things into order and say, actually, I'm not even going to do that type of argument because it's silly. That hasn't changed, by the way, in 2020. <laughs> There are some very weird things going around that really just need to be ignored. People say some really, really silly, silly things. I remember faintly Y2K. Uh, I don't know if you know what Y2K is, but people were batting down the hatches because of Y2K. 
uh, and the church got involved with that whole thing for some reason. Um, the coronavirus. Wow. The end has officially come because now there is another virus plaguing mankind. As if there haven't been other viruses that have plagued mankind before. Uh, definitely we need to have compassion and seek to show some sort of understanding of what's going on with that deadly, deadly, lethal virus. But my goodness, let's not start some silly, weird eschatology thing because of a virus going around in the world today. There are just some silly things out there that we simply just need to step aside and let go and keep moving forward. And that's exactly what Timothy was going to do. In fact, Paul's going to say in chapter 6 of this book to literally circumnavigate those who, who just flood their own minds with these silly, silly things. People who just want to argue. People who just want to debate. People who just want to kind of, I got you, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't quote that verse right, got you. Revelation 20, that's where the millennial is. There's only six verses in there that talk about the millennium. That's the only time the millennium is used. You should have known that. You don't know that. I got you. You don't even know what I'm talking about. Why are you got with chapel? It's crazy. You just need to circumnavigate those individuals and not give them any attention. And just to keep moving. Paul was telling Timothy, and he's telling us, we need to do the same exact thing. It's interesting to me how the enemy wants to so take away from the gospel. And he will even use the Bible. He will even use things in the Bible to take away from the gospel that is found in the Bible. Blows my mind. The gospel is our aim and it's our commission. And he says that in so doing this, and so not having time wasted with irreverent, silly wives' fables, you're to train yourself for godliness. Remember last week or the week before, no, yeah, two weeks ago, we looked at what is godliness. Remember that? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, what is godliness? It's not wearing a black suit with a white ring around your neck. Godliness isn't bowing 15 times a day towards a particular religious site. Godliness isn't performing some sort of religious exercise that's maybe whatever. Godliness is genuinely Christ-likeness. That's what godliness is. You literally are becoming more like God as you mirror and image Jesus Christ in this world. Paul said that very same thing as he presented the incarnation of Jesus in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3. This is the mystery of godliness. This is the mystery of what it means to be like God. It's this. And then he presents the very incarnation, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ himself. But here's the rub for us Christians here this morning. What are we doing to train ourselves in godliness? Not simply a, I want to make a whole bunch of to-dos, but really imploring God, God, help me to be more like your son. Because this world needs to see that billboard. This world needs to see impressions of Jesus Christ in this very dark, dark world. This world needs to have light and salt. This world needs to see Jesus Christ in every way, shape, and form. You know, one of the great reformers 500-something years ago was Martin Luther. And there's a famous painting of Martin Luther uh, that's, I believe, in the Louvre right now. And Luther, in this painting, is seen pointing at the Word of God, the Bible. And then as he's pointing down, he's pointing another finger like this. And he's looking this way as he's pointing. And what he's pointing at is literally the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is hanging on a cross like this. So he's pointing at the Word, he's pointing at the cross, and then in front of Luther, you see this mass congregation. And what this congregation is so incredible. This congregation is literally seen, and the, the artistic ability to get these heads to look as if they're looking at Jesus, are all looking at the cross. So you have Luther pointing at the Word of God, you have Luther pointing at Jesus, and you have the congregation before Luther looking at this cross and looking at Jesus. Why is that so profound? Actually, as you get really, really close to the painting, there's one person, there's one head in the painting that's actually turning and looking at you. So all of these heads are turning and facing Jesus. One head is turning and looking at the viewer of the portrait. And you have Martin Luther pointing down at the word of God and looking up and pointing at Jesus. As if to say, and this was the intent of this painting, what a superstar preacher that Luther was. One of the fathers of the Great Reformation. And by the way, if you're a Protestant Christian, which we are, there is some thankfulness you need to have because of the Reformation, okay? We're here because of the Reformation. Praise God for it. 
So you have Luther literally saying, don't look at me, the great superstar preacher. Look at Christ. As I'm pointing to the word, look at him. And the crowd in the whole like the church chapel thing are looking at Jesus. And one of the people in the crowd is looking at you to invite you to do the same exact thing. Don't look at the man who's pointing at the word. Look to Jesus who the word is always pointing to. That is our commission as Christians. That is godliness. We don't have, hey, come look at me. This is how I'm being like Jesus. I'm so awesome. I'm so cool. No, it's literally look at me so you can simply see Jesus. And I don't even need to be an account of who I am because Jesus just needs to be shining through me. The question is, how are you growing in God likeness? In Christ's likeness, so that when other people see you, they don't see a man or a woman. They're literally seeing Jesus, Christ. And then he says in verse 8, Bodily training is of some value, but godliness is of value in every single way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Bodily exercise profits something, but training in godliness Profits so, so much. Profiting to the point of literally pointing others to Jesus. Where I come from, there's a, where I came from, uh, there's a weekly gathering of over 17,000 people. They ascend on this golf dome thing. And in this dome, they have various speakers that come in and they, you know, give motivation speeches. Or maybe they'll have a pastor that gives the gospel or presents something from the scripture or something like this. And I'll never forget it. In that rotation, in that speaking rotation that year, because my job as a campus pastor was, was to kind of be embedded uh, but like near the speaker. So if there was ministry that needed to happen, I had to go down there and pray with people and point them to some ministries that we have at the school and so on and so forth. And I'll never forget this. So far in that semester, there was zero standing ovations. Uh, when the whole school rises and all the faculty rise to applaud the individual who is preaching or teaching or sharing or motivating or whatever, that's kind of like a Wow. Like, that person really hit it. But so far, and I forget what the month was, but so far there was no standing ovations. Except for this woman. She's about five foot two, walks up to the podium, opens up this massive binder, and begins to share her story and how Jesus saved her. And how through her story and Jesus saving her life, she's literally pointing everybody to the scripture. To Jesus. She's just sharing her heart from the word by the gospel saying this is what this is how God found me. This is how I was dead in my sin and trespasses. And this is how Jesus found me literally at the end of her conversation, at the end of her talk, the whole entire stadium lit up with just an applause. With a standing ovation. And we all got the text. Hey, you all need to be behind the stage. There's a lot of students lining up to talk with her, to pray with her. Like, go, go see her. And by the way, this woman uh, was, was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and, and had a whole speaking thing there. And she was a solid, godly, Bible-loving woman. And so I went behind the stage, and I'm standing there, and I'm seeing the students kind of come in and out, and I'm just getting, you know, being available, and I'll never forget what happened. So there she is, standing with these three students. And they're just crying and sobbing because finally they had someone who got kind of something that they were going through. And they're crying and they're crying. And they're thanking her and they're thanking her and they're thanking her. And as if like she was on a cloud somehow, she literally looked at these students and said, just remember Jesus. Just remember Jesus. And with that, she turned and she looked at me and said, okay, I think you need to take them down. I said, okay, thank you so much. And she literally like floated away. She didn't really float, but she like walked away to kind of catch her plane and to go back. Actually, she lives in North Carolina to come back to our home state. That was a woman who got a standing ovation in front of all of those thousands of people. Yeah, at the end, the very core, she existed to point others to Jesus. She was no doubt trained in every form of godliness. But bodily training is of some value. But man, training in godliness is of value in every single way, Paul says. But, but let me just say, like, the Bible doesn't say not to train physically. <laughs> okay? Bodily exercise is a good thing. Okay? You need to have some sort of regimen of, of, of physical fitness. That's good. <laughs> uh, that's actually really, really good. But man, when it becomes something more than just a thing you get to do to keep your body fit and healthy, it becomes an idol and something that's not good. Paul is not giving an indictment here against bodily exercise. We need to be physically fit. We need to have some sort of exercise. That's a good, good thing. 
but certainly it is not as good as training ourselves in godliness. How much time does an athlete spend in the gym or on the field getting ready for the game or getting ready for the competition? They're literally exercising to the point of really just honing in their own bodily function to really maximize who they are as an athlete. So the question has to be asked to us, how much time are we spending maximizing our time for godliness? What are we doing in our life so that when we are really out there and shining salt and being light, that God is just magnified from our life so that one day when you're standing before 17,000 people, it's not like, hey, yeah, come sign my book. It's no, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Paul will use this phrase godliness 15 times in the New Testament. And actually, he doesn't start using it until the pastoral epistles. And every single time the word godliness is used in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Peter, it is always the same word. And it literally means reverence and awe for God. Can I just say, it must be true. When you love, when you respect, when you have reverence for something, you no doubt begin to take what is you like love and respect on as your own personal identity? Man, I love Jesus so much. I respect and revere him so much. I want to be more like him. So that when to the point that you're so loving that and respecting him and, and being wanting to be like Jesus, you start becoming like Jesus. Rich Froning, you know who Rich Froning is. He has been rated as the fittest man alive in 2011, 12, 13, and 14. Four-time CrossFit game champion. Having the title fittest man alive. He's my age. Or maybe he's like a year older. I think he's 32, maybe 33. His training exercises and workouts are all over the place. If you want to really, really get your squat rack on, look to that guy. If you want to know what to eat, look to that guy. Maybe buy some of his bison because he now has his own bison field somewhere in like Nevada or something. He is literally showing himself as a way to be a CrossFit fit man. And so if you're following him on Instagram, if you're looking at his YouTube videos, if you're hanging your squat rack like he does with the American flag in the background, you begin to do things like he does because you want to be as fit as he is. You want to train as he would train. Because he's so cool. He's the fittest man four times in a row. Isn't it true though then, as we have an awe and respect of God, as we look to God, we would be training ourselves in godliness that we would begin to look and act and be like God, Christ himself, on this earth. So here's the question. How do we grow in our awe of God? How do we literally say, God, I want to revere you more. Lord, I want to, to have a bigger picture of who you are. Jesus, man, religion has scarred me. The church has scarred me. Family has scarred me. I don't know, Jesus, how to kind of make you out of, of, of everything that has been kind of shown to me. I need help to be more like you because I want to believe in you. For those who do believe in him, God, how can I grow in this, in this godliness? First, I would say you have to, to literally determine that you want to be like Jesus Christ. Not just because you're a Christian. Certainly because you're a Christian, yes but because you genuinely as individual man and individual woman want to say, I want to be more like Jesus in the way I interact with my husband, my family, my people that I work with. I want to be more and more like you. If that's not what you're thinking about every single day, my exhortation to you would be, why not? Why is it in your heart, I want to shine for Jesus? I want to be like him. Certainly, if you are a believer here this morning and you understand at what great cost Jesus Christ came in the world to save you, all of that blood, all of that beating, all of that scourge, all of that just embarrassing mocking that he did for you, certainly, certainly, it is in us to say, Jesus, I want to be like you because you did so much for me. Here are some ways in which you can grow in godliness, in the Christian faith. Number one, and I would say most importantly, is in the word of God, the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 172 says, My tongue will sing of your word. <clears throat> My tongue <clears throat> will sing of your word. It's interesting to know that Psalm 119, out of 176 verses, 173-ish, all talk about the word of God. 
that's actually a year study for you. I mean, just read the read Psalm 119. I mean, you'll be you'll have a lot of good reading in Psalm 119. Number two would be in fellowship. Hebrews 10:25 says, "Do not forsake the fellowship of the brethren." By the way, there are some phenomenal opportunities here at Calvary Chapel Fayetteville that you can be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. In creation, Psalm 8:3. I don't know if there's any hunters in the room, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping to come. Come back into the hunting season, maybe this year. I'd like to get into a stand again or some random field I get lost in. But if you've ever hunted before, it's a pretty amazing thing when you get to be in that stand or on that field really early or really late at dusk and you just get to see creation. You just get to be up there and look at the squirrels hanging out and doing weird things as the sunset is just setting behind those trees and then you're you're hearing something like, oh my gosh, there's a deer coming. It's just an awesome experience as you get closer to God in that way. In prayer. Ephesians 6.18, at the end of all of that armor we put on as Christians, Paul is going to say we need to be praying at all times. And then lastly, and I would even say maybe even secondly, as as far as importance, is in song. In song. Do you sing to God? Do you have a song in your heart because of what Jesus has done for you? Um, I guarantee you, if you go to bed listening to Beyonce, you're probably going to wake up singing Beyonce. But if you go to bed singing a great song of what Christ has done for your life, it is going to permeate your cerebral everything and you're going to wake up singing about God. You're going to go in the shower singing about God. You're going to be looking at your children. You're going to be humming a tune about God and singing to Him. Colossians 3.16-17 through 17 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or day, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In those ways, we can be growing in our God-likeness, in our Christ-likeness. And then finally, Paul's going to say in verse 9, This saying is trustworthy. This saying is trustworthy. This is the second time that Paul uses this in the pastoral epistles out of the four times that he will use it in the New Testament, all four of which are in the PE or in the pastoral epistles. What is Paul talking about? Is he saying this is a trustworthy statement? That is what he said so far? Verses 1 through 8 of chapter 4? Or is he saying what's about to be said is actually a trustworthy saying in verse 10? Well, actually... Uh, and every time that it is used, excuse me, one is used in Titus, that's my fault, one is used in Titus, but all the other times are used in First and Second Timothy. All times that that phrase is used, it always is pointing to salvation. It is always pointing to a point of the gospel. First Timothy 1.15, 4.9, we just read it, Second Timothy 2.11, and Titus 3.8. In every single one of those references, Paul is going to use this phrase, this is a trustworthy saying, and what he's about to say literally always points to salvation. Always points to Jesus. Always points to what Christ has done in the act of salvation. So Paul is literally bowing up, ready to say, this is something that is so trustworthy. This is something that is so good. And this is something that must be received with full acceptance. And what is it? Verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God. I want to end this morning with this final note. After everything that Paul has instructed to to do in Ephesus, he's closing up this small section about Being a good minister. By the way, all of us are ministers. He's going to say, Timothy, Timothy, we have a hope that is set on the living God. It just needs to be said that the Christian God is alive. That Jesus Christ is not some sort of myth or fable or religious thing that was preserved after millennia, so on and so forth. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead so that we could have relationship with the living God. You know, I, I hope as you're growing in God-likeness, as you're going, growing in Christ-likeness, that that really permeates your mind. That when you're meeting with Jesus, you're not meeting with just the air in your closet. When you're singing to Jesus, you're not just singing to some weird, hopey dopey thing in the sky. When you're in fellowship with your brothers and sisters, you're literally thinking, wow, Jesus actually died for them so I could have relationship like this with them. 
When you're reading the Bible and the Bible is just coming alive to you, you're understanding that you're literally reading about Jesus on every single page, on every single chapter, because the word of God will always point you to Jesus, much like Luther did in that incredible painting. Let's pray. Father, we know that we live and exist to bring you glory. And Father, I pray that we would always live our life to point others back to you. Jesus, that we would be good ministers. God, that we would train ourselves in godliness. That we would have nothing to do with silly myths and things that just slow us down. But Lord, we would continue to run our race well, knowing that we have an opportunity in this life to literally point others to you, not to ourselves. Not to our talents, not to our gifts, not to our skills, not to our selfish ambitions, not to us, but to you, Jesus. Help us, Father. Lord, for those who don't know you, for those who are here this morning who have maybe been confused about you. In fact, maybe even in your name, they've been hurt by you. Lord, I pray for those individuals this morning that you would meet them in a special way. Maybe this week, maybe not today. Lord, maybe you need to give some time to let the word settle in their heart. But I pray, Lord, you would do that thing that you would be drawing all men and all women to you, Jesus. So if anyone's here this morning that doesn't know you, I pray that this morning, Lord, they would have true, true, like an understanding of who you are, Jesus, that you came in the world to save sinners. Thank you, Lord, for today. In your name we pray. Amen.